This week, robot hunts killer starfish, hurricane in a tube, and gravity train runs out of steam. Florida, America's sunshine state, and home to the US's first sustainable town. This is Babcock Ranch, powered befittingly almost entirely by that big burning ball in the sky. It's 33 degrees. The humidity is, I believe, about a million percent. And I've come to a solar field, so you don't have to. 343,000 solar panels span some 440 acres, providing 75 megawatts of electricity, and that's enough to power 15,000 homes. One of the big problems with solar energy has always been when the clouds come over, or especially when it gets dark, the whole thing effectively goes dead. And we haven't really had a way of storing solar energy until very recently. But over there, 10 buildings full of batteries. So it's a start. A pretty good one too. Babcock has the largest combined solar and storage facility in the US. The batteries can store 40 megawatt hours of electricity, which is enough to keep around 2,000 average US homes alight for four hours. Of course, lithium batteries are just one way of storing energy to use later, and we've seen other methods before. There's Electric Mountain in Wales, which holds water at a top reservoir until power is needed. It then releases it back down to a lake below. Switzerland's air cave fills itself with compressed air and then blows it out to turn turbines. Well, now, over in California, Kate Russell is on track to see a new solution. Since the oil crisis of the 1970s, California has invested heavily into wind and solar power, with the latest state legislation calling for 50% renewable energy by 2030, and all new homes must have solar within two years. The state is way ahead of its target, so much so that they've had to start paying neighbouring states to take some of the energy from them. As we've heard before, the problem is storage. The grid was built to handle fossil fuel generated power and storage solutions like hydroelectric dams are in short supply. Batteries too are very bad for the environment, turning unused renewable energy into not such a green solution. California-based company Ares have come up with one alternative. Ares was really an attempt to to think of a way to use the inexhaustible, always reliable power of gravity, right? We know gravity is going to be there for us. We don't have to worry about shortages or any of that. So how do we use gravity to store and then discharge power when we need it? One of the most efficient ways to move mass, known to man, which people have spent billions of dollars to perfect, are railroads, right? 150 years of experience, incredibly efficient, steel wheels on steel rails, are, are one of the most efficient ways to move mass. Dubbed the gravity train, energy is stored using electricity to push its weight uphill. When you want to take the energy out, you let gravity pull the train back down, using the friction of braking to slow the train in order to make power. It's the same way hybrid electric cars like the Prius work. You see those wind turbines there behind me? They're completely still, even though there is clearly plenty of wind right now. Well, it's not because they're broken, it's because there's no more room to store the energy they would create. And that's the problem the gravity train will solve. When you're into excess energy production, use it to power the train up a hill, and when you want the energy back, you just send the train back down again. This demo train carries almost five tonnes uphill, storing energy as it goes. 
A full-scale installation will return 80% of the stored energy, which is not quite as efficient as a huge dam, but has a lot less impact. The amount of energy we store is the, the weight of the train times the height of the hill. Uh, simple mathematics. So the more weight and the higher the hill, the more energy we can store. We need long, gently sloping planes. But we had clients who approached us and said, well, I only have steep, rocky, craggy mountains. So we've developed an, a new variation on the Aries technology at almost vertical. In October, the company breaks ground on the first full-scale Aries in the state of Nevada. It'll be used to fine-tune the inconsistent energy flows that are a natural part of using solar and wind power. Minute by minute, it will trim the imbalance between load and generation on the grid. So our trains may need to go uphill for a minute, they may need to go downhill for five minutes. Uh, they're constantly acting like a large flywheel that allows the grid to stay at exactly 60 hertz. It's early days yet, and the concept has still to be proved in Nevada, but it could help solve one of the renewable industry's biggest conundrums right now, balancing the ebb and flow of nature-made energy in a more sustainable way. After we run 30 or 40 years providing energy storage and helping people, we can remove all of our facilities very quickly. 96% of them can be either repurposed or recycled. It's only 4% of our facilities could ever go into a landfill, and we're trying to reduce that. And we can then plant some native vegetation, and six months later, you never know our facility was there. That was Kate on a roll in California. Back at Babcock, I'm going for a solar-powered spin in an autonomous shuttle with its chief financial officer. So I guess the motivation for having these autonomous vehicles is that you, you're encouraging families here not to have as many cars. Correct, yeah, I think our thought is that over time, most, most families in the US have a two-car family. And so our hope is that we can get from a two-car to a one-car family where you have your car for the family perhaps, but if you have a car for a commuter for work, you won't need it anymore. You can take an autonomous shuttle or an autonomous vehicle to work. And so over time, which will take a long time, perhaps there are no cars, but I think realistically within the next 10, 15 years, you could see a time where you go from two car to one car. You think the US government at the moment does understand? I think they get it. I think they're getting it. I mean, the government's a little bit slow to move typically, but I think in major cities and major metros where traffic and pollution are an issue, and technology come in and save a lot of that, I think government's willing to step up and help out to make sure this comes to fruition. And we're seeing that slowly. Um, we think what we're hearing and the reading about is that a lot of major urban cores are gonna become, uh, un un become restricted access. If you're driving your car and you're trying to get there, you can't get in. Up to a certain mile, three miles outside of the city core, you can't get into the city core without being in an autonomous vehicle, for instance. But outside of autonomous vehicles, I mean, building uh, a city or a town that is sustainable. I mean, you're not going to be able to do this in colder, more crowded parts of the world. No, I think that's right. I think this is fairly unique. We have a unique situation here where we have the benefit of scale. There's not a lot of folks that own 18,000 acres of land. That's a big, it's a big chunk of dirt. Along with autonomous shuttles, Babcock has its own water and waste facility. And as well as reclaiming water, there's a restriction on the amount that you're allowed to use. The tin roofs reflect heat, making homes 10% better at keeping cool. And the ranch's on-site gym is environmentally friendly too. It's powered by the treadmills. One incentive to get off the couch, I suppose. It is a commendable vision to build a town with all these sustainable values, but I can't help thinking that you can only really do this when you are building a community from scratch. I mean, could you imagine trying to retrofit an existing town with all of these technologies? You basically have to tear up the infrastructure and tear down all the buildings and start from scratch anyway. Babcock has been built in the style of older towns to attract people who aren't necessarily fans of the new build feel. Hi, are you expecting me? People like the Kinleys. Yeah. Mind if I just step inside your air conditioning and yeah, stay here yeah. forever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a robot vacuum cleaner. I just want to kick those things. A coffee making fridge. No, it's set up so it won't spill all over the place. <laughs> and of course, an electric car. 
For Richard, a self-confessed geek and actual real fan of Click, Babcock was his calling. You know, as close as that may Just reading tech blogs all the time on the internet and, and it sounded fascinating to me. I like the idea that it was environmentally friendly and was looking forward as far as energy uh, solutions. We, in Atlanta, we lived just downwind from one of the biggest coal polluting plants in the country. And I thought, that cannot be healthy. I think of it as uh, guilt-free living. In the UK, when you have a small uh, town with a, a central area mm -hmm. that you can walk to mm -hmm. and encourages walking, mm -hmm. so it's the lifestyle. And while the buildings may look like historic Florida, uh, for me, it was also all the technology, all the, you know, mm -hmm. having one gigabit of fiber optic you know, internet to the homes and yeah, he liked that. And I, you know, <laughs> yeah, he definitely we, liked that. We... Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that the World Health Organization classified gaming disorder as a condition capable of causing debilitating addiction. Arguing with your malfunctioning tech could soon become a whole lot more intellectually stimulating. IBM put its project debater to the test this week. The system listens to the arguments of its human opponent and then scans hundreds of millions of documents in its memory to construct what it considers to be a sound and logical argument. Having analyzed the data, I will argue that we should... Ever wish you'd caught something in slow motion after you'd filmed it? Well, chip designer NVIDIA has shown us how AI could be used to fill in the gaps, turning 30 frames per second footage into 240 frames per second slick slow-mo. And finally, the battle for our eyes and ears is hotting up. Facebook has gone head-to-head -head with YouTube, with plans to let social media stars into its previously high-end watch program. Meanwhile, Facebook-owned Instagram revealed plans to host longer video on the platform, much like YouTube. And YouTube itself has been busy launching its subscription service, making content available offline in 12 more countries, including the UK. Confused? Or just go watch a video and relax. Hurricane season is just around the corner in the US, and that means that South Florida is once again at risk from deadly winds and storm surges. Much of it lies less than five meters above sea level. Miami Airport is just one meter. And in the further future, even moderate estimates of climate change will mean that the sea will swallow much of this area by the year 2100. So it's probably no surprise that some of the most advanced hurricane research in the world is going on here at the University of Miami. This is a hurricane simulator. It's a 23 meter long glass tank filled with water and connected to an enormous fan, which means they can generate the strongest winds over water anywhere in the world. Up there, they can simulate a Category 5 hurricane. A 1,500 horsepower motor drives 65 meter per second winds, whipping up spray and smashing waves into whatever they put in the tank. The sensors in the tank measure how those waves behave and what they do to Florida's buildings because it's not so much the winds as the storm surge, the water driven inland by the storm, which causes so much destruction and loss of life. In a landfalling hurricane, that two meters high flood water is accompanied with large waves on top of that. And, and the wave loading is really dramatic. So that's what we're talking about when waves that are quite often breaking and, and coming and hitting a structure. And the thing is, it's an impulsive force, but it's repeated. Boom. You know, every, you know, many times during a storm, even if it's only an hour, and that can really do dramatic damage. And what have you found so far? Well, How can you build houses better now because of what you've found? One of the key things that we've 
found in some recent measurements related to the structures directly is that off is with these decking is actually the where the wave actually traps air underneath it. And then that's like an explosive uplift force. So you really have to look at how you engineer the attachments and things. Okay, we're about to go to full speed. Okay, here comes the spray now. Understanding the forces on these models will help develop new guidelines on what support structures would help a building to withstand the onslaught of a storm surge. So if somehow you were under the sea during a hurricane, this is where you would see. It's better than being on top, I tell you that. Have you ever been in there when it's on Category 5, even in your Christmas parties? Uh, no. Right. We would not go in there because the, there's not much to hold on to, and the back of this is like a cheese slicer. <laughs> so don't really want to be uh, turned into sausage or cheese or whatever. The team here aren't just trying to make stronger buildings. They're also testing ways of stopping the full force of the waves from getting to the land in the first place. Here, they're looking at the effect of a sea wall on protecting the house. But further out in the water, something you might not expect, a coral reef. We've actually been reading some global studies that show that wave um, energy is actually dissipated 97% on average as waves hit a reef crest and go towards shore. So, so they, can, they, they act like a 97% efficient wave break. That's right. If it's a healthy reef with a good reef crest and a nice reef flat. It just doesn't look to me like there's that much coral there and <laughs> it doesn't come to the surface. So right. can that really do a good job? It can actually, yes. So with the waves you've got the, um, the kind of circular motion that happens at the top which causes circular motion all the way down kind of in, in little ellipses down to the sea floor and anything that disrupts that that motion should help to uh, slow down the wave. The problem is that just at the point where we need coral to protect from climate change, climate change is killing coral. Although corals, much like the trees in a rainforest, are the principal habitat builders of the ecosystem, and if you lose the corals, just like if you lose the trees in a rainforest, you end up with no ecosystem. The corals that build that habitat are very thermally sensitive. They're probably the, some of the most climate change sensitive species on the planet. And the reason why they're so sensitive to climate change is they're very vulnerable to just small changes in temperature. Uh, an unusually hot summer causes a coral to turn white in a process we call coral bleaching. And that process of turning white is, is a process whereby this symbiosis between the coral animal and these tiny single cell plants that live inside its tissues that symbiosis breaks down and the coral spits out its algae, turns white, and unless it can somehow recover those algae, it will die. It starves through lack of, uh, of, of food. Andrew Baker has spent the last 25 years trying to create coral that's more resistant to increasing temperatures. We've found over the years that by uh, uh, gently um, uh, bleaching corals deliberately in the laboratory, we can encourage them to change their algal symbionts in favor of these thermally tolerant types. So we've done a series of controlled experiments in the lab, and just now we're starting for the very first time the first pilot experiment of doing this out in nature, in the field, in reefs off Miami, where we're what we're calling stress hardening these corals, encouraging them to change their algae in favor of the heat tolerant ones that will actually help them resist bleaching and hopefully persist into the future. So beautiful, isn't it? And while they're working towards growing more resilient coral here in Miami, there are, of course, projects going on across the globe to protect the coral that we already have. Nick Queck has been to see one such project at the most famous coral reef in the world. The Great Barrier Reef, Australia. Wonder of the world. Earth's largest living thing sprawling some 1,600 miles. But this paradise could soon be lost at the hands of a very surprising vandal. 
Crown of Thorn starfish eat coral, and although they're found here naturally, recently too many have been pouring in at once due to major weather events and ocean pollution. You would think a starfish would be a cute, gorgeous thing that you would see on the Great Barrier Reef. Crown of Thorn starfish, not so much. They're a bit spiky, they're quite ugly, they can have up to 20 or 30 arms. But the biggest issue with Crown of Thorn starfish is they can eat up to a metre of coral a day. Um, and when they're in plague proportions, they can absolutely decimate a reef. To the rescue, the ranger bots. These underwater drones autonomously scour the reef for starfish and prick them with a deadly dose of bile salt. The bots use an artificially intelligent algorithm to identify starfish and then target them. Their developers say they're 99.4% accurate and get smarter with time. Traditionally, divers have monitored the reef by going out and doing a visual check and they record their findings onto a slate. Something time consuming, not to mention expensive. They can only be in the water for up to three to four hours a day. They can't dive at night, whereas the ranger bot has the capacity to be in the water for up to eight hours a day. It can dive at night. It also doesn't have some of the human failings that we know that we have, where we actually see and miss things as we're getting dragged along under the water. Working around the clock could make a big difference too, because evidence suggests the thorny carnivores come out more at night. The newer bots have lights, so their stereo cameras can still see once the sun goes down. So inside these things you've got inertial sensors, pressure sensors, a GPS so it knows where it's going, and it's also got two computers working simultaneously, one to process the images and one to know where it's going, understand the navigational route. The game changer is these six thrusters, which allow it to go forward, backwards, up, down, left and right, but also side to side. So when it spots these crown of thorn starfish, it doesn't need to do a big loop-de-loop. -loop. It could just stop and zap them where they lie. The bots are team players too. The beauty about having this is if we have multiple vehicles, we literally just put them here, we send them off in all directions, they pop up 500 metres later, they already know how many they've seen. So we say, OK, 0, 0, 0, 10. OK, that's our focus area. You know, within 20 minutes we know roughly where we should be focusing our efforts. We'll never outcompete a human, we're not trying to outcompete a human. But if we can um, give them the tool to extend their operational capability, then that's, that's a goal here. Constantly patrolling the reef, the rangers can also monitor water quality, measure coral bleaching and map the deep blue like never before. One of the biggest issues we have with the Great Barrier Reef is because it's so big. We actually only know a fraction of what's going on underneath the water. Um, and without that information, it makes it really hard for marine park managers to actually have a true understanding of what's going on and where do they need to direct their time, energy and resources and people. But they're still weather dependent. Too strong a current and our poor little ranger can be thrown violently off course. For all their ingenuity, isn't the relatively small work being done by these bots just a drop in the ocean? The Great Barrier Reef is facing many threats and so there isn't going to be a silver bullet solution to what it's actually facing. But the Ranger Bot is just one step in that path that we can take in terms of trying to make sure that we can look after the Great Barrier Reef from a local level while the world really gets its act together on climate change. That was Nick in Queensland, and that is it for our sustainability special from Babcock Ranch here in Florida. We are staying in the US for another week. Next week, we fly north to Boston, home of MIT, which always offers up plenty of very, very cool innovations. So really looking forward to that. Hope you can join us. In the meantime, don't forget, we live on Twitter at BBC Click. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you soon.